How to Get the Most Out of Your Banker, brought to you by CFO On Demand from Fitzpatrick, Bongiovanni, and Kelly CPAs. Please support our sponsors, McPeak Wealth Management Group of Wells Fargo, Ansero IT, Levin Stoller, Attorneys at Law, Allegra Marketing, Integris Investing, Tim Pashley, Cooper Levinson, Attorneys at Law, Rich Asset Management, Ocean First Bank, Sturdy Savings Bank, Bank of America, Persky Marone, Attorneys at Law, Merrill Lynch, Altor Oakley Group. Community banking to me means that our officers are involved, they're local, they live here, they're involved in organizations that we support. It's important that the community responsibility that we have is embedded from every employee in the organization. I think Ocean First definitely understands the community better than some of the larger banks who aren't from this area like we are. What I love about Ocean First Bank is knowing that every single customer that walks through those doors is being treated like family and we all work together as a team here. And now our presenter, Lou Bongiovanni. Hello and welcome. This is Lou Bongiovanni, and uh, welcome to this month's presentation. It'll be on the topic of how to get the most out of your banker. Uh, some housekeeping things first. This is a live webinar. So I encourage you to, to ask questions. There's a button on your screen that will uh, allow you to email questions during the presentation. I'll leave a minute or so uh, at the end of the presentation as well. I will be the only one who, see, who sees the questions and I will um, leave time at the end to answer each one of those. So I encourage you to ask questions. Uh, another item is, um, each participant, a registered participant, will get a copy of this webinar. So you can see it again if there's a, a segment that you want to spend more time on, uh, or you're free to share it with uh, other people who you think might benefit from it. And I, of course, appreciate that. The more people that see this webinar, uh, the better. So now let's get started with what we'll cover here. How successful business owners work with their bankers. We'll talk about how do loan officers need, what do they need in order to borrow what you need. We'll also cover how best to negotiate loan terms. And lastly, some takeaways for you at the presentation, from this presentation, is we'll talk about the seven ways to get the most out of your banker. Successful business owners do what other business owners either don't know to do or don't want to do. They, they see the importance of relationships. One relationship, a common thread that I see, is that they value their banking relationship. They elevate that to an important relationship uh, as well as other ones. They look at their banker, they look at their lawyer, and they look at their CPA as key business advisors. That banking relationship is important, not only with the individual banker or loan officer or such, but with the bank itself. They also understand the synergism of working together, these three professionals. For example, uh, currently I have a, a client who's building a, a, a new location. They have uh, the, the attorney working on variances and working with the transaction. The banker is looking to finance it and have all the financing in place. And the CPA, in this case, uh, is our firm. And we're doing all the financial analysis to see the viability of the business and, and what return on investment will be rewarded for this effort. Uh, lastly, what su successful business owners uh, do with their bankers is they talk about not only current, but perspective plans. They share their goals with the, the banker. The banker knows periodically when they meet 
what is going on in the business, not only where they're at now, but what their plans are in the future. So I encourage you to use your banker in the ways that I've seen successful business owners do such. Let's talk about the role of the loan officer. That's it's such a key person when you talk about a, a banking relationship. So we want to understand what their role is in the relationship and what they can and possibly can't do. First of all, they're the business advocate to the loan committee or the board, whatever governing body ultimately decides what type of loan that or how much of a loan that you're going to get. So it's important that the loan officer uh, is a good advocate for you, that they can tell your story well, not only in financial aspects, but in a narrative. So anything that you can do to help them and, and give them um, different aspects or uniqueness of your business or your venture uh, will be helpful uh, to them being a good advocate. They're also the liaison between the bank and the borrower. They are the ones that are communicating information not only from you to the bank and loan committees, but, but back to you as well from the loan committee to you. So it's important that they're good communicators, that they stay in front of the issues and they keep you posted on all aspects of the process, no matter whether it's a loan refinance or a new loan request. Lastly, the loan officer is your financing advisor for not only current but future plans. You want to make sure that this person possesses the skills to help structure loans to your benefit. It's important that they know your business and you intimately and that they know what the bank can and can't do and are upfront with that information. And again, it's important that they share your goals, they understand your goals, and they understand your timelines. Now, when you talk about the borrowing process, which is it's a key component with the business owners that we work with, they're very entrepreneurial. They understand how important it is that financing is, is so critical to their growth. Um, and they need to know uh, what the process is and what they need to focus on as far as the borrowing process. Four items that come to my mind, and they all start with C, so I call them the four C's of bank borrowing, are cash flow, collateral, credit worthiness, and cash in the deal. And we'll go through each one of these in the subsequent slides. First, cash flow. Uh, banks, when they're looking to finance, want to make sure, obviously, they're in, a, they're in business to make money. They want to make sure that they're going to be able to be repaid from their loan. The best way that they assure this is that they want to make sure that the cash flow from the venture that they're dealing with uh, will support uh, the, the debt that needs to be repaid. So they'll look at things such as global cash flow from the business operations or from the person individually, or if the person has other business activity, they will, um, they will take that into consideration as it relates to cash flow. They'll look at things such as debt coverage ratios, which takes the business's uh, EBITDA number and, and divides it by the principal and interest on the debt service. Proof of, of cash flow is demonstrated by monthly cash flow analysis for the first year and quarterly for the next two years. That's a common way to help support uh, your cash flow expectations. Next, collateral. Uh, collateral, again, is critical in the, the loan process. The, the lender wants to know that if something goes wrong and you're not able to perform on the loan and pay it, that there are safeguards in place so that uh, the bank, in this case, does not uh, get hurt. So they look at uh, the business as well as the owners to see if they have enough collateral to secure the loan. Uh, they might also seek personal guarantees from the owner, so the owner personally ensures that 
if there is a uh, default on the loan, they will use their personal assets in order to make good on it. And most of the times, real estate is the preferred uh, item to use as collateral. Banks like that because it's, it's easily traded uh, and there's values that can be ascertained rather easily. Proof of collateral is usually demonstrated in personal financial statements as well as balance sheets of the company. They can see the assets and liabilities and net worth of an individual and make a determination if there's sufficient collateral. This third C, creditworthiness. Um, again, the banks recognize that they're lending money to a business, but they're also lending money ultimately to the individual or individuals involved in the business. So they want to make sure that there is a good credit history with the business and with the individuals involved. One way the banks could discover that is looking at uh, credit reports. There are entire credit departments in the bank that ensure that the risk that they're taking with this individual or this business is worth um, is worth taking. Uh, one, one issue in this area that was a problem was back in 2008, during the financial crisis, many individuals and businesses' credits were damaged as a result of, of many troubles, not only uh, locally, but, but globally. Uh, and that created a real problem for bankers and uh, renewing lines of credit, as well as developing uh, offering fresh loans. Uh, and because of that, that created some tension between them and the borrowers uh, because the borrowers were looking for the bank to help them recover and the banks could only go so far so fast. This is an area that took a lot of attention between the banker and the, um, and the borrower to, to work through. And the fourth C, that is uh, cash in the deal. The, the bank wants to make sure that the uh, business owner has skin in the game as well, that the bank's not the only one taking risk in this particular venture. So if this is a worthwhile venture, the business owner can demonstrate it by risking their own capital into the deal. Uh, a lot of times business owners will indicate that they have a lot of sweat equity, they put a lot of time and intention in the deal, and by all means that is important and has uh, relevant in the process, but banks also want to see real equity, real risk taking place here. If they don't see it, they're leery of making such an investment. Uh, the best way of proving how much uh, you're investing in the deal is you list your cash sources. Uh, when you're looking to borrow, they ask for what you're going to use the, the money for. Uh, and they also ask where the sources of all the money is going to come from other than the bank lending. And that's where you would indicate how much you're looking to invest in the deal. So there are the four C's of bank borrowing. Next, how to negotiate the best loan terms. Uh, I, I get this question rather often. I've gone through this process many times over the, the years. And, and what I've discovered is there's four key aspects in negotiating a loan that needs to be considered. And, and if these aspects are addressed properly, usually the right amount is lent under the right terms. Um, for the right period of time. And these four aspects are the loan structure itself, uh, interest rates, loan fees, uh, collateral options, and supporting government agencies. And we'll address each one of these in the next slides. Okay, loan structure. Um, it's really important to determine the structure of the loan is to understand what the funds are going to be used for. So usually what the bank wants to get a very clear handle on is what exactly will these funds be used for? That answer will determine the best type of loan structure. 
typical loan structures might be a line of credit, asset-based lending, and term loans. So for example, a line of credit would be commonly used when a business is looking for working capital to help them uh, handle cash flow uh, deficits during the course of the year. So if you have a seasonal business or one that covers a lot, of, has a lot of inventory or accounts receivable, then lines of credit are very helpful because the business doesn't need it continuously. They're not necessarily buying a particular asset. They need it to help with the fluctuations of cash. So lines of credit and a common one is a revolving line of credit where they accept a certain credit limit and then you could borrow up to that limit and repay it during the course of the year. There's usually a requirement of a 30-day rest period, meaning you can't use that uh, those funds for a 30-day period, a straight 30-day period, in order to support the fact that you don't need those funds on an ongoing basis as you would a different type of loan. So lines of credit usually for a one-year period, and they do have rest periods. Another type of loan structure is asset-based lending. I see this commonly when a client might have a, a, a high level of receivables that maybe the collection of them is not as fast as they, they need to support the expenses of the business. So the banks will lend you money up to a certain percentage of, the, of these receivables, somewhat like a line of credit, but it's asset-based lending. And third, a term loan. Third, uh, a term loan, which is most common when a business is buying a particular asset, whether it's real estate or equipment, something tangible that has a useful life. Um, the number of years in which the, uh, the term loan should be is usually dictated by the asset. Uh, a common rule of thumb is uh, determining what the useful life of the asset is and having the term loan over that period of time. So you might have a piece of equipment that you might have for seven to 10 years, but it's true useful life where you get the most out of it is say a five-year period. They'll do the loan over that five-year period because that is the period of time where it generates the most income to repay that loan. Next. Interest rates and loan fees. Um, the interest rate is obviously the cost of borrowing the money, and everyone wants to know to negotiate the lowest interest rate possible when borrowing money. There are different options you have when it comes to interest rates. Uh, and that's fixed or variable or floating uh, interest rate. Uh, it's also called floating. Uh, fixed interest rates uh, are appealing to many borrowers because it creates certainty. They know exactly what the cost is going to be each month, uh, and they can factor that into their budgets. Variables are attractive because that rate tends to be lower normally than the fixed rate, but it has the capacity to fluctuate even higher than the interest rate. So you're, you're bringing on some risk there. Um, a good loan officer will present both options depending on the, the asset that's being uh, purchased and allow you to run some numbers and, and choose. We do that often for clients. Usually, even in the fixed rate scenario, banks will lock into, let's say, a three or commonly five-year period of time at a fixed rate and then uh, have it where they review the interest rate because interest rates may have fluctuated and then they will update that interest rate after the three to five year period to a new fixed rate. Uh, that's uh, also common. Variable rates are usually connected to some kind of indicator, whether it's the prime interest rate or a LIBOR or something of that nature. So there is some outside parameter in which determines how that interest rate fluctuates. Loan fees are, are also another factor in the, uh, the borrowing process because, again, that is a cost to borrowing. And there's different options that you can uh, consider with loan fees. Loan fees are based primarily on the relationship with the bank. If you have a person who has a long-time relationship with the bank and they're borrowing a certain dollar amount versus someone who 
is brand new to the bank, the person who's been there for a while will most likely get more preferential loan fees because there's a longer term relationship there. Uh, also with the loan fees, there's a trade-off. Sometimes banks might encourage you or, or give you an option to pay a point or some fee up front in exchange for a lower rate. So you would need to, again, run some numbers and see if it's worth paying some kind of upfront fee or points in order to get a short-term, uh, I'm sorry, a lower rate going forward. That's an analysis that uh, needs to be done. But but interest rate and loan fees are critical and need some, some review before you can determine uh, what option is best for you. Next, collateral options. We talked about this briefly. Real estate by far is the most appealing uh, to banks. They'll look at personal real estate that's, in, in, that's outside the business, as well as business real estate that is owned by the particular um, business and they will give they will lend a certain value or they call it loan to value or LTV on the fair market value of that real estate. So they'll commonly loan 75 to 80 percent of that. So if you have a piece of real estate worth a hundred thousand dollars regardless of what you paid for it, uh, they'll loan up to eighty thousand uh, dollars on the collateral of that real estate assuming nothing else is is uh, burdening that real estate. That is the higher of the percentages. Marketable securities is something also that banks uh, find appealing. However, uh, more volatility with those, so they might not lend that same high percentage on marketable securities. Um, and then lastly, business assets, inventory, and accounts receivable. Um, these are typical uh, items that you'll see on a company's balance sheet. Uh, banks will lend to that, but usually a much lower percentage. Business assets depreciate very quickly or hard to sell on an ongoing basis. So uh, as much as a business owner would say, hey, here's a piece of equipment, give me collateral, uh, use this collateral, it, it's rare that you get more than 50% on it. And then one thing also that I want to point out on this screen is some items that you might think will get you collateral uh, do not. One example that I've come across a couple of times is a liquor license. If you have a, uh, a, a restaurant and they're looking to st uh, structure their financing or, or a liquor store, uh, uh, no, no real collateral offered on liquor licenses. Banks do not like that as collateral. Okay, and the the fourth item is uh, supporting government uh, agencies. Um, there's a number of programs available to borrowers. However, they take time to find and take time to work through the process. There are opportunities there, but you need to have the time and the direction to take. Here are four areas that there are agencies that I found have been helpful. Uh, they all have terrific websites that are very comprehensive and are items that, if the fact pattern is right, can be extremely helpful in the lending process, either to get you lower interest rates or, in just some cases, free money. The SBA is probably the most popular and the most obvious, the Small Business Administration. Uh, they have different programs. The one that I find is the most popular is something called a 504 program relating to real estate. So if you're looking to buy real estate, you want to put as, much, as little down as possible. Banks will want you to put down 20%. This program uh, allows you to put down just 10% uh, to uh, acquire the loan. Now, there are trade-offs in this particular case. SBA does have fees in the neighborhood of 2 to 3% of the loan, so there's a cost up front that's higher than most banks, uh, and the interest rate might not be as favorable. But again, you would use those particular programs to buy something that you would not normally be able to in a conventional setting with a bank. EDA is the Economic Development Administration. Uh, that is also a government agency that offers grants, not only loans. And I've seen very successful um, grants uh, being made in this department. Again, it takes time. Uh, there's some cost to have grant writers. 
but some of the benefits are, are terrific. A shipbuilding company in the area had a large piece of equipment. They applied for the gr a grant and they got a considerable amount as free money to them. Um, EDA looks at things such as job creation and training. They focus on particular industries that they think uh, are, are dying or very difficult to get into, farming, shipbuilding, things of that nature. They tend to support uh, more so, but it's a great program if it's a good fit for your particular business venture. And UEZ in New Jersey, the urban enterprise zones, there's 27 designated zones in New Jersey. They give incentives from sales tax, and people probably know that the most about urban enterprise zones. Um, uh, but also, there are some loan opportunities there at preferred lower interest rates, again, if your fact pattern fits with it. So it's beneficial that you allow enough time in the process of financing that you could explore these different agencies. These are government agencies. They notoriously don't move very quickly. But uh, if you have enough time and your fact pattern is right, they can be extremely beneficial. Lastly, local government programs are available too, depending on particular municipalities. For example, uh, last year I had a client in, uh, who was opening up a substantial business in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia gave a number of incentives from real estate tax abatements to um, fine, excuse me, financing options that, um, that was very appealing for the company, and it was definitely worth exploring that particular area. So uh, Atlantic City, I know, also offers certain incentives from time to time. So it's worthwhile to look at the, those programs, and many of these programs work with the banks in order to get you the best deal possible. So it's worth the time and effort. Okay, now for the uh, takeaways for you. Here's the seven ways to get the most out of your banker. Uh, number one, uh, meet periodically with your banker. Uh, we've touched on this to a certain extent. It's a relationship, not just transactions only. You wanna keep the banker uh, posted as far as your your current dealings invite them over to your business location periodically so they can see firsthand what's going on and maybe offer some suggestions you also want to discuss the other services the bank offers from cash management services to credit cards any retail services they offer banks are constantly trying to improve their offerings to their customers so you want to stay abreast of what they have to offer and most importantly, in my opinion, when you're meeting with them, you want to discuss not only the good things that are happening, but the bad things that are happening. If there's challenges that you're coming across or you were trying a particular venture and it didn't quite hit the mark for you, you want to be upfront with it. Now, there's different ways that you could talk with your banker. I'm not suggesting that you bare your soul to them or have this uh, what was me type uh, approach to it. That does not bode well at all when dealing with your banker. Just to be upfront and letting them know what challenges you have and how you're going about uh, addressing those challenges, I, I think it, it is very helpful. And banks appreciate bankers appreciate that. And when it comes time to renew loans or to apply for a, a new loan, they will be able to add that to their story, how maybe there was some adversity that the, the business had and how they worked at overcoming that. Uh, they understand that not all businesses have good news only. Uh, most of them have good and bad news, and it's important that, um, that the banker sees that aspect of, of a particular business. Number two, Use the bank's resources. Uh, most people be surprised at how much work the loan officer and the loan committee need to do in order to uh, either renew uh, a particular loan, which gets done annually for uh, a company, or to apply for new financing. Um, in order to do their due diligence, uh, loan and credit departments need to do quite a bit of research on a company and it's especially their industry, their industry locally, regionally, and, and nationally. That's all great information that a, a business owner can benefit from. Um, 
it's completely appropriate to ask um, to ask the loan officer to uh, to share that information with you. And also, they're looking at the industry compared to your company and establishing be benchmarks, or what I indicate here as KPI, key performance indicators. So they can also share with you how your company measures up to these industry data that they are, are looking at. It's it's useful information and can help you improve the operations of your company. And finally, industry trends. The banks have a good pulse on the industry and the industry trends. That's part of their business. They need to know that because they make determinations as to what industries they want to be involved in. So all that information is very useful and can help as far as some future plans for your own company. Number three, remember the four C's when borrowing. Again, if you're in the market of borrowing uh, additional funds or renewing your existing uh, loans, we talked about these four C's. Uh, that's critical in the process. Uh, to elaborate on that, you wanna make the loan officer's job as easy as possible. You wanna make it such where uh, they can tell your story uh, as as convincingly as possible, and they want to know that you can speak their language if need be, and you know what the key uh, points are that they need to uh, bring up when it comes to boards or, or loans committees. There's clearly a bank lexicon that uh, is, is, needs to be uh, understood in order to get the, the most out of your borrowings. And finally, uh, understanding the risks and the rewards that uh, the bank uh, needs to consider as it relates to your business. So, you know, playing out best and worst case scenarios. So if you're thinking about opening up an additional location and you do some analysis, I did that recently with a restaurant where they had the history of their single restaurant and now they want to open up a single, uh, a secondary uh, location and understanding the the risks and the rewards and maybe doing break even analysis is is very helpful um, for the, uh, the banks to tell a, a good story. Number four, Provide the bank with timely information. Uh, in this case, not only do you need timely information, but you need accurate financial information. Uh, you will be surprised at how much credibility the banks put on the CPA or CPA firm that you deal with there. Uh, they understand, uh, the banks understand that they're heavily relying on your financial information. And if you're working with a, a CPA who they've had uh, history with and, and a good relationship with and have rapport with, then they're going to feel that much more comfortable with the CPA and how they advise you. Uh, that's what we do a lot with CFO on demand. We are we work extensively with the banks. We have relationships with them, and and the banks know what to expect from us, and uh, and and they know we're looking to help. Uh, the process. So that goes a long way, especially if the bank does not necessarily know the borrower very well, but they know the CPA, that'll help move the loan request along and, and get better terms. Um, you want to meet your deadlines. You want to, if, if you promise the bank that you'll get them information at a certain period of time, uh, they appreciate that. As you can imagine, they're dealing with multiple customers with multiple deadlines. Um, there are a lot of timing and logistic challenges for them. Meeting your deadlines makes their job easier, which again, you'll be rewarded by uh, getting a better look at, uh, at loan requests. And you want to allow enough time. Uh, I alluded to that with the government agencies, but also with the banks as, as well. Understanding there are busy times for them. Um, uh, where they might get a, an abundance of loan applications, which there's only a certain amount of resources that they have in order to approve it. So you want to make sure that uh, you give them enough time in order to line up um, the financing that you need and so that they can satisfy uh, your timelines as well. 
Number five, understand the bank's lending process. Now, bank size many times dictates the lending process at that particular bank. There might be different lending limits depending on different management uh, levels. It's important that you understand that and you know what that particular bank's lending limits are compared to what your needs may be and who to work through if you're looking to borrow something that's beyond your particular loan officer's limits. You want to let them know in advance and have them bring in the proper uh, staff in order to be able to satisfy uh, what your needs are. You don't want to find that you're dealing with the wrong liaison, the wrong person for this particular transaction along the way, because that'll just uh, delay your process here. You definitely want to make allies with different levels of the bank before you need them. Uh, you also want to know how loan committees are structured. They're usually made up of boards, um, mostly of, of uh, different business owners or community leaders. And you would want to know who's on that board. That may influence your chances of success uh, with a particular venture or with a, a dollar amount that you're looking for. So it's important to uh, understand uh, who's on the committee and exactly how that committee makes their decisions. Uh, as far as credit, as I mentioned to you before, credit gets assessed by separate person, separate department. As far as the credit worthiness of the loan, um, good loan officers usually give very insightful information as far as um, what concerns that credit officer might have, and maybe there's ways that you can mitigate it. One thing uh, is uh, you know, looking at your credit report, making sure all the information on there is accurate. Sometimes you might have old uh, information that's no longer relevant uh, on a credit report, and uh, it could impact uh, that decision. Okay, number six, leverage the bank's network. Uh, the bank, um, there's usually and a business owner has complementary services that that other businesses can offer to promote uh, your particular uh, business venture. So if you're a retailer, there might be other retailers, uh, retail businesses or suppliers that uh, can promote your business. Banks are a great networking um, hub, if you will. Banks are required you know, businesses might not know this. Uh, you, you see banks in the community quite a bit. Banks are required to support their local community uh, businesses as and residential. Uh, that's part of the reason why you see them at a lot of events for sponsoring a lot of events. So by nature, they have a rather broad network that they uh, support. Um, it's very appropriate to try to tap into that network and, and benefit from it as well, within reason. So seeing if there's referral sources that uh, the banks might have for, uh, for your company is appropriate to explore, as well as any suppliers and ultimately customers. If you're uh, in, a, um, in a service business or retail business or, or such, and there's particular customers that you're looking to target, the banks might have some suggestions or clients who they work with, who they can make some general introductions. You usually find plenty of bankers at Chamber of Commerce meetings or business association meetings there. So introductions are usually um, very common. And, and ultimately, and this is true for CPAs as well, you want to be respectful of confidentiality. There's only so much as far as uh, relationships and information uh, a banker or a CPA can share. Obviously, we want to take into consideration uh, the, the client's confidentiality uh, as well as the other clients and customers that, that the banker has. So you want to be respectful of that as far as what you're asking for in the way of introductions or, or networking. And number seven, know when to shop around. There are times when banks just aren't a good fit for um, uh, an entrepreneur, and it's okay to shop around and look for other banks there. And you want to find one that has the best fit for you. Uh, sometimes banks 
uh, have industry preferences, or put another way, they blackball certain industries. So certain banks might not like to finance bar restaurants or hotel motels. And if you're a bar restaurant or hotel motel, you might be with the wrong uh, bank there. As far as uh, bank services, you want to make sure that the services you need uh, right now, uh, not right now, it's been for a little while, uh, you know, electronic banking, being able to provide those type of services are, uh, are, are very popular. So you want to make sure that your bank is able to keep up with that and, and offers the latest and greatest services relating to uh, electronic banking or e-commerce. Of uh, cost effectiveness, you want to make sure that the cost of banking with that company from a retail standpoint, there's transactions as well as lending, is uh, is com competitive uh, for you. And the relationship with the loan officer, if your relationship with the loan officer is excellent and that loan officer switch banks, that might give you cause to look at the bank they're going to. Or on the flip side, if the relationship is not very good with the loan officer and there's no other loan officers at that particular bank, that might give you cause to, uh, to seek a, a better loan officer or, or advocate. And finally, items out of your control when banks merge or get acquired, which happens a lot and has happened a lot over the last few years, uh, that shuffles the deck and that tends to create some opportunities uh, to, uh, to look at uh, other banking relationships if they might be a, a better fit for you. So that's, that's always something that uh, should be taken into consideration. Okay, as a quick recap, the seven ways to get the most out of your banker. One is meet periodically. Two is use the bank resources. Four is remember the four C's when borrowing. Five is provide the bank with timely, and I should say accurate information. Understand the bank's lending process. Remember, each bank has a uniqueness in their lending process and understand how each person down to your loan officer plays a role in that process. Six, leverage the bank's networks. They have a broad network of potential customers or suppliers or referral sources. You want to tap into that and, uh, and, and see if that can help your business. And seven, know when to shop around uh, if it's not the best bank fit for you. At CFO On Demand, we help entrepreneurs foster productive uh, banking relationships. We understand that um, small businesses need help with financial analysis. They have internal accounting departments, the business owners trying to grow the business, and what tends to suffer is financial analysis. Uh, the banking relationship is a very important part in the analytics of a company, um, and that's an area that on CFO On Demand we focus on so that your business owner can feel comfortable that the analysis is being done and the liaison between the internal accounting department and the business owner is sound so that the business owner can make better consistent decisions and, and the business owner can become more of a business strategist and not just a regular operator uh, of the company who deals with putting out fires from day to day. They're actually looking beyond um, the day-to-day -day operations. And the one thing we know for sure, and, and we get reinforced, it seems like monthly, is that a business strategist, an owner who's a business strategist, always beats a business operator every time. They're always a step or two ahead uh, of their competitors and have a, a much better advantage uh, in their competition. I encourage you now, if you haven't already, uh, you're welcome to uh, send in a, a question. I have one or two here that I'm going to look at, uh, but if you'd like, you take a second to uh, type in a question. Uh, while you're doing that, here are the upcoming live webinars we'll be offering. The next one will be on May 9th, and that will be employee incentive-based compensation. I get this question a lot with business owners who they understand, they appreciate how hard it is to find great help. And once they do, they want to have compensation plans that incentivize those key employees to stay with the company. Uh, we've spent 
a lot of time with many clients on this particular issue. Uh, we'll put together a webinar that addresses many of those points and gives you some ideas and some takeaways as far as how to best put one of those together. And then you see the other upcoming presentations as well. Okay, so let me read those questions here. All right. One question says, I, I hate debt, but realize it's need to grow my company. Uh, how do I determine how long I should borrow? What's the, the borrowing period for a particular uh, asset or, or venture? Uh, I get this question a lot, and I see this as a recurring problem. Business owners who are debt averse tend to want shorter term periods for their loans than they really should have. Uh, they might say, okay, it's an equipment loan. I could do five to seven years. Let me do five years because I'm going to get this over with. And, and the downfall of doing that is that if there's a hiccup in the business, ex, let's say it's an, a, a crisis that really is not internal, it's external, you really leave very little to no wiggle room in order to be able to weather that crisis because you've tightened that timeline so short. Uh, many times business owners, I recommend to business owners, take the longer time frame. Yes, it will relate to, translate into more interest if you do it for the full seven years in my example. However, there's no penalty in paying those debts off sooner. And you could pay a seven-year loan over a five-year period by making extra payments. I'd rather see that happen and allow yourself some flexibility if there's any hiccups in the business. That works out a lot better. And the last question is switching banks. Uh, yes, um, it, it, we talked about the switching banks process. I, uh, you know, should I, the question in the, uh, asks if you should uh, focus on the bank or the loan officer as far as the decision. And actually, the, it's both. Uh, the, the banker and the, the loan officer, uh, the, the banks, I'm sorry, and the loan officer are both factors that should be considered. It's hard to pinpoint one over the other. I see we're at our timeline. Thank you so much for joining us, and hopefully you'll join us next month. Take care.